Welcome back to Thinking Matters this morning. Um, it may not be morning when you're watching this, but either way, um, good morning and welcome back. Um, today, um, I want to touch upon a couple of things that have to do with the fact that we're not together. We haven't been together for over a month. And there are two expressions which people use. One is an expression that absence makes the heart grow fonder. This really reflects about actually thinking, which is what we talk a lot about here on Thinking Matters. When you think about someone fondly and they're not around, you desire to be with them. It kindles your, your positive feelings towards that person by what you think about about that person. Uh, and I think that's really important that we understand that with the fact that we've not been together. And I hope that you're missing that time, that you have fond memories of us gathering as a church family, worshiping together, being together, and that you can't do that just by watching Pastor Jack's message, no matter how good it is. And I hope you're watching those online. It's not the same as being together with other people. God designed us that way. The church is meant to be that. And so I would hope that in this time while we're apart, that the absence is making your heart grow fonder. Unfortunately, there is a flip side to that where people say out of sight, out of mind. And that's a danger in that you could have replaced that time and you may feel that you're doing just fine without gathering with us. But I will tell you that that's not how God intends it. And if we don't live the way God intends us to live, eventually there'll be a price to pay for that. So the absence from the church can't go on forever. It's going on. It's been very helpful. I can tell you that the numbers of people who have gotten sick and potentially died has been lessened by the fact that we've not been communicating this disease to each other. But those days will end and I look forward to being uh, together with you again in the near future. So today on Thinking Matters, we're still in Romans and we've been working our way through Romans. The beginning of Romans was really the expressing of a problem that we all have. That problem is that we violate the way we live from the way God would want us to live. So we have sin. That's the biblical term. And then it presented the solution to that. The solution to our sin is Christ. And there's no condemnation in Christ. The problem is dealt with. And now, as we continue to move forward in Romans, we're dealing with the results of that. The problem, the solution, and now the effects of that. So that's where we are. How do we go on living? In that. And of course, there's two ditches on the road. The one ditch would be that of being pharisaical and having rules that we're going to live by. The other ditch would be being like the Greeks and saying, nothing matters. It doesn't matter how we live. We can do whatever it is we would want to do. We have license. We have freedom in Christ and just to do that. And so we've talked about living in love. That was the end of chapter 13, where it talked about loving other people. And that's what God requires of us to do is to love other people. If you look back at the Ten Commandments, they're uh, about how to love other people. Don't steal from them, don't covet, don't harm them. It also talked about loving God. Remember, Jesus summed up the entire law by love God and love others, and that was the, the uh, Ten Commandments. And so now we're in uh, chapter 14, where we're talking about something, and we talked about it last week, but I want to bring clarity and move forward about disputable matters. If you look up disputable, the word that was there in the Greek, the word has to do with unreasoning. So when you reason through something, in other words, there's not a precept that God has set out. We have to use our brains to reason through it. When we reason through it, we come up with different conclusions. And how are we gonna go forward in Christ as brothers and sisters, as a church, when we have different conclusions on matters. And that's what Paul's talking about in all of chapter 14. And as a matter of fact, if you read through it, which I hope you will do, you'll see that there's some redundancy there. And redundancy means that it's really important on how we do it. So I'm going to read a, a portion of that passage, and then we're going to talk a little bit about that. Starting in um, verse 14 of 14, it says, As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not let your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way 
is pleasing to God, is pleasing and approved by God. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Uh, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. So let's just go back and just think about some of those things in there for just a moment. Um, that when someone is not thinking that they think they shouldn't do that, then they absolutely shouldn't do that. At the end of this, it says that everything that, that does not come from faith is sin. So if they don't think they should be doing it, they shouldn't be doing it. And in our freedom, if we think it's okay to do, we can't push that onto them and make them violate what they think is wrong to participate in it or to be hurt by watching us do it and, and then being a problem around that. Now, you might say, what are these matters? Well, there are many matters. I've thought about it a little bit. And here it clearly talks about what we eat and drink. It also talks about everything else that we do. So things like rituals within the church. What rituals do you see as important or not important? And in your freedom in Christ, many of those things may not be important, but to some people, they may still desire to do them. We can't be, as it says in the beginning, passing judgment on one another in these areas which are disputable. What are some other areas? The use of alcohol. It talks directly about wine in this passage. That would be one. Another one might be your use of media, what you choose to participate in or not participate in. And there may or may not be, if there's not a scriptural mandate, then you're going to move forward in your own reasoning and draw a conclusion which might be different than, say, my conclusion. Whether or not you can go to a restaurant that has a bar in it, for example, that might be problematic for some people. Whether or not to own a gun or not own a gun, people will dispute and argue over that, but the scripture doesn't speak directly about gun control. Homeschooling. Do you homeschool your children or do you send them to public school? You could make good reasons on both sides of the street for that, but scripture doesn't speak absolutely on that with any kind of clarity, so it becomes a disputable matter. The use of example for King James only. Do you think that you can only read King James where someone else would say, no, you could read another translation? These are disputable matters. How we exercise them has to be done in a, a fashion which is loving, which is edifying, which builds up both parties. And so the person who's larger is in chapter 15, it says, um, we who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So in other words, we have to have in mind what it is, what are the unintended consequences of my exercising my freedom. Now again, not an area where there is a precept, but in an area where we are extending a principle into how to live. We have to do that in a loving fashion. We can't trample on what other people have concluded for themselves. Now that's not to say that in a church that we wouldn't continue to share ideas, have a discussion to, over things that we might not agree on, to try to educate and to try to grow, which would be in keeping with this, the benefit of everyone to grow forward, but not to have disputes over it. Unity is really important. It talks about not having these things destroy the work of God. Now, the work of God, remember, is saving people from our problem. And if we're causing division, we're destroying that work. We're pushing people away. Um, in, in the last, in, in 15, 5, it says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of of unity amongst yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ. So as we strive to live, as we move forward having our salvation and how to live, we need to do that in love. And we need to be careful that we don't do that legalistically, that we don't do that with such freedom and as if there were no rules that harms other people. Either ditch, too many rules, no rules, and a free-for-all, neither would be the loving fashion. We need to move forward in that way. I look forward to um, being together with you again. We could have an exchange, a discussion around some of these things which are in the scriptures, which we have to reason through and think about and apply to our lives. That's what this is all about, is uh, being Christ-like and learning and growing and living in a fashion. Am I increasing my righteousness by these things? No, my righteousness is made perfect by Christ, because when God looks at me, he sees Christ's righteousness, not mine. So I'm not perfecting my righteousness in this. I'm just living out 
a love-based life, doing what's best for other people in a fashion that would be honoring to Christ, because that's what he's asked us to do. Love God and to love your neighbors as yourself. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.